Morning, everybody. Morning. Sounds a little better. All right. All right. It's great to be with you again, uh, and I echo the sentiments of Pastor Reed, uh, just in enjoying the meal together and worship together with all of you, and uh, this is a special place in, uh, in my life and in my week and in my Sabbath day of rest. I'm going to get right into it here. Um, we're going to finish up this little mini-series within a bigger series. The mini-series is Freedom. The bigger series is a God First 2015. Um, the idea behind this is that you know, we prioritize God as number one, that He does things. He, he puts new things into our life. He adds things for our benefit, uh, for our thriving, for eternity, but you know, things that we need to use and have at our disposal, weapons, if you will. And one of the things that He wants to, to make sure that, uh, that we have and enjoy and demonstrate to this world is being, being free. Being set free. Um, a couple weeks ago, we looked at, at freedom and presented three dimensions. Freedom from our past, freedom for our future, and today we're going to talk about freedom in the present. The theme of, of this entire uh, God First is, is Matthew 6, 33. If you, if you seek first my kingdom and righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. And last week we talked about how that is contexted in a, in a whole section uh, in the Sermon on the Mount on worry, on do not worry. The verse after, verse 33 in Matthew 6 says, uh, Therefore tomorrow has enough worry of its own. So don't worry about tomorrow. And so last week our theme was about uh, winning the victory uh, over fear. So today we're going to talk about uh, freedom in the present, or freedom right now. And I hope this is practical for you. I hope you look at this as like some equipping, some strategies, uh, just some knowledge of how to, be, how to be free in the very present, right here and now. And I think about this as momentary living. And that's what I believe we are called to do. It's to live life moment by moment. I know you've probably heard of the phrase, uh, don't count the moments, but make the moments count. Make the moments count. So we've heard that maybe. Uh, so I want to talk today about how to live in the moment, how to enjoy the moment, how to, how to have a peace right here, right now, how to resist temptation in the heat of the moment, right? If you heard that phrase, the heat of the moment, I think we, we associate that with maybe a strong urge of temptation or, or high emotional tension, the heat of the moment. We're going to talk about that. Now, we talked about the past, we've talked about the future, and I want you to know that you can be dealing with your past and working through things that from your past, you can be planning for tomorrow and preparing, as we're called to do, without living there. That's, that's the thing we're talking about today. Without living in the future. Without living in the past. We can be dealing with the past and, and uh, learning from our past and using our past. God gave us a memory for a reason. It's not like it's just a blank slate of, you know, we don't remember anything from yesterday. It's there for a reason. And we want to be, need to be, called to be prepared, but we're not called to live there. That's when we lose our freedom, is when we live anywhere but right here and right now. Spiritual freedom is a present for the present. It's a gift for right now, okay? In Psalm 118, 24, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, in it. In the very right now, in this day, in this moment of today, the present, the gift that you have right now, rejoice in it, live it, excel, thrive, win right now. We're commanded to live in the moment of today, and here's some reasons why. Why are we commanded to live in the moment of today? Because one, it demonstrates the most faith. God gives us, a, his word is a lamp unto our feet, and that's, that's just a picture of the very next step. The most faith is demonstrated when we just live in the moment. Think about kids. Think about why they are stress-free. They have faith in mom and dad that they can take care of everything. They're living in the moment. It's faith. Um, we're called to live in the moment of today because that's all the supplies we're given for is for today. We're not given supplies for tomorrow, next week, next month, next, next year. The strength we're given, the knowledge we're given, the time we're given is only for today. It's right now. It's the way that God has ordered it when he made it. Days, night, day, and then rest, seasons. You know, all this timing, God ordered it so that we would have enough for each day. 
We're called to live in the moment of today because that's when we'll enjoy life to the full. The minute we start living in the past, the minute we start living in tomorrow, now that joy is being sucked right out of it. That's how we enjoy life to the full, as Jesus said he came to give us. Well, we experience that when we live in the moment of today. That's how we're going to persevere, uh, persevere through adversity. In a hard day, in a hard moment, in a hard season, in a trial. How do we get through that? One day at a time, sweet Jesus. That's how we get through it. One day at a time. Lord, take my cup and fill it up one day at a time. Remember singing that hymn ever in your life? You don't look like it. No? Anyway, I remember that hymn. It still resonates in me at, at, at times. And I used to sing in college, walking out of the, the classroom the first day when they'd give you the syllabus for the entire semester. You know, and you'd get overwhelmed with everything you got to do. And all of a sudden, it just came to me. One day at a time. Right? That's all I got to do. I'm not going to get caught up in November, December. I'm just going to live life in September when those syllabuses are passed out. One day at a time is because that's the only sphere of influence we have. We can't go back and affect the past, and we don't have an influence in tomorrow. We're not there yet. The only influence God gives us is where we're at, is in that moment, is in that place. And that's where we have an influence, an impact, an effect. We're called to live in the moment of today because that's where we are literally transformed. That's where we're transformed, in those moments. And that's the only way that we're going to be set free and remain free is if we live momentarily. And this is difficult to do. Easy to preach, easy to say. It's difficult to do consistently, isn't it? I, mean, I don't know if you've tried to do it, if you've tried to, the whole abiding, remaining thing, we're going to read that. It's challenging to remain there. But thankfully, we have help. We have a helper to assist us in this process. We have the Holy Spirit. And listen to what Paul wrote about the Holy Spirit. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So we have a person, we have a power source that is freedom, that offers freedom, that will give us the freedom in that moment and by each moment. And so our job is to do what? Our job is to remain and keep up. If that's the source or place of freedom, then we better stay there. We better keep up with that. And here's what Jesus said in John 15. Remain in me, my friends, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And that means living free. Try living free without me. Try living free without my power, without my spirit. It's not going to happen. So our job is to remain and abide. And secondly, to keep up. Paul put it this way. Since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. I remember when I was young, my dad would uh, take me with him when he'd go out into the woods for whatever reason. I don't know whether we were hunting or fishing or just walking. And as a young kid, I had a hard time just staying with my dad. Either he was going fast and I was really trying to keep up, or he'd stop and my head was on. I'd bump right in and I'm like, whoa, what are we doing here? Let's get in here. Shh, stop. Look over there. And he'd see something and I was oblivious to maybe a deer or just maybe something pretty in the woods. Or, and then he'd take off and then I'd have to try and keep up and... It reminded me of, of what it's like day to day to try to keep in step with the Holy Spirit because there's times that we want to go and we think, come on, let's do this. And then there's times that, that we're just, where are you going? I just want to stay right here. And, and keeping up with our Heavenly Father and where His Spirit is leading is difficult. But it's spiritual. It's not physical. That was just a picture to, to help us see what's going on in our hearts and in our minds. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So let me ask you, where is the Spirit of the Lord? Yeah, yeah. As, as Pastor Reed said, we're assuming the majority of you in this room today are born again. And if you are born again, you are born of His Spirit. So the Spirit of the Lord is in you. So where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So the freedom is in us. So you can be free right here in church, right? You get freed up here in church. But you can be free when you're at home. You can be free in your car. You can be free at work tomorrow. You can be free uh, when you're out with your friends. You can be free at school. You can be free on Friday, and you can be free on Monday. How many people are just a little more freed up on Friday, right? Because it's Friday. But if the Holy Spirit is in you on Monday, then you should be freed up on Monday. Really? It's supposed to work that way. 
You can be freed up on the beach, and you can be freed up uh, stuck in a snowdrift in February. Come on, Ohioans, right? People in, in Florida aren't just free all the time and we're in bondage up here. No, the Spirit of God is in us so we can be free wherever we are. He travels well, right? He travels well. We can't go anywhere if we have Him and not experience freedom. I can do all things through Christ who sets me free. In Acts 16, the story of Paul and Silas arrested for ministering, for serving God. They were put in jail. They were shackled in the inner cell. And about midnight, they were praising God. They were praying. They were singing hymns. You know what that's called? That's called freedom. Shackled in an inner cell of a prison. That's freedom. That's spiritual freedom. They were set free from, from the norm of how they should have been, how, how we should react in those situations. They were totally set free. That's all God, is it not? Humans don't have the strength to do that to have that kind of attitude, to have that kind of outlook, that kind of joy in that situation. Momentary living is achieved as we fight battles as they come. Not going into tomorrow and fighting that battle. No. If you wake up tomorrow and there's a battle to fight, then you fight the battle. That's momentary living. That's not worrying about tomorrow. That's enjoying the moment of today. How do we handle the heat of the moment moments? The heat of the moment moments of life. When temptation is strong, when we are weak, when emotions are controlling us and running the show, when we are flat out under spiritual assault. The heat of the moment is what I want to talk about. How do we win those moments? How do we remain free? I have, I have some examples that we're going to read through in Scripture of real humans like you and me that were in the heat of the moment. Some went well, and some did not go well. But they're written for us there to learn from. How many of you were ever told by your parents, that's a no-no? That's a no-no. All right. So I'm, I'm going to be cute on that, and, and I'm going to talk about some no-nos, okay? Some no-nos that we need to know when we are in the heat, of the, the heat of the moment. All right? Is that up there? Do we have anything? Has there been words up there at all? Oh, there has. Oh, there we are. Okay. Five no-nos for the heat of the moment. These are things that we have to know. You got to know them. One, we have to know God. In the heat of the moment, we got to know and rely on the love that God has for us. First off, we have to know Him personally, because you're void of any power if you don't know Him personally. If His Spirit isn't in you, by confessing His His name as your Lord and Savior. You don't have access to that power. So you got to know him personally. you got to know him intimately. you got to know his voice. Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. And my sheep follow me because they know my voice. So knowing God is knowing his voice. Uh, knowing God is knowing his presence. Right? What's that feel like? If, if you've experienced God in you, you know what his presence feels like. Compared to when it doesn't feel right. Come on. Have you been there? It just doesn't feel right. And you know that feeling? All right. That's good to know that feeling. Because if you know that feeling and you know what his presence is, you have a pretty good indicator of what you need to know in the heat of the moment. Okay. The first example of this, the first temptation, Genesis chapter 3. The serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the trees. We may eat from the trees in the garden. But God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open. You will be like God, knowing good from evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. They realized they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Knowing God. Now, who, who would have known God or been in the presence or in fellowship with God more than his first creation, than Adam and Eve? But somehow, when the serpent spoke to Eve... She didn't recognize that this wasn't God talking to her. This was a foreign voice. This was a different voice. 
Somehow, they didn't realize that, that there was an influence, a presence leading them that didn't feel like God's presence. And that's really where it went awry for them. Notice the tempter. His first tactic is just to ask a question, just to pose a thought, and then just let that brew. And just let that brew. He didn't come right out and assault. He didn't come around and say, hey, eat this. God's okay with it. He just asked a question, right? Just to get our thoughts thinking, just to get our attention away from God, just to get us not focused on what he did say. See, if we are intimate with God, it's not going to happen. So just direct over here. Just here, look over here. Look over here. That's all he gets us to do. And then he comes back with the second thing, a little more direct assault. In verse 4, you will not certainly die, he said. But that was after he posed the first question. Notice the tactic of Satan, who it said in Genesis, is crafty. James in 4, 8 says, come near to God and he will come near to you. And in the heat of the moment, we got to draw near to God. In the heat of the moment, we got to feel his presence, know his presence. And if it's not that, then it's not God. Then it's not good. You don't got to know all your enemies. You don't got to know all their tactics. Just know God. Just know him personally. Know his presence, what it feels like. Know his voice, what that sounds like. And if it's not that, then flee. Isn't that simple? We don't got to know a who's who of all our enemies. You know, we just got to know if it's not God, if it doesn't feel right, then it's not. Flee that. One of our coaches this summer has been bringing his daughter to the start of every practice because we start early and his babysitter's not there yet. So he brings little Rosie into practice every morning. And when she comes in, she's like tagging along. And every morning I try to warm up, hi, Rosie, how are you? And right away she like clings beside her dad, like gets behind his leg and like peeks out at me. Like, wow, Joe, you trained her really well. So that to me said this week about what we need to do as children when we're encountering something that's a little foreign, something that's a little uncomfortable. Cling to our father. Cling to our Father. It's just instinctive. When there's a scary man right there, I'm going to back behind my dad right here and hold on tight. And in the heat of the moment, we got to, one, we got to know God. We got to know him intimately, and we got to stay near. Number two, we got to know ourself. To win in the heat of the moment, you got to know yourself. One, acknowledge, acknowledge your strengths and weaknesses. What are my personal triggers? What naturally tempts me? Know yourself. Know what your, your current temperature, okay? Are you hot? Are you lukewarm? Are you cold? Where are you at? Where are you at day to day? And if you're not feeling it that day, we got to know that. If you're in a, quote, bad place, you better acknowledge that. That's good to know going into a situation, I am not in a good place. Probably shouldn't try to resolve conflict when you're not in a good place, right? Probably not going to go well. Know your, <laughs> know your temperature. Charles Stanley said once, never forgot this, we talk about satanic attacks, spiritual assault, never get too hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. He said, halt, stop. If you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. That made sense to me. Because if you're in those places, you are open season. Satan knows that, and he will use any and all of those to assault you. So don't get there. And if you are there, get back to your father. Cling to him and get built back up before you go out and try to do anything else. This is the account of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. In his critical moment, right before it all, you know, went down, Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. He said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. Then he took Peter and two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, along with him. He began to be sorrowful and troubled. He said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell on his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it's possible, please take this cup, or may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returns and finds him sleeping, right? So, to me, this really spoke about Jesus, even Jesus knowing himself, knowing that his soul was overwhelmed to the point of death. He didn't go alone. He took his friends, and he took three of his closest ones with him further in a secluded place. He said, guys, I need you right now. I am so weak. I am so troubled. I need you. Please pray for me. That was critical. I think in that heat of the moment for him, he needed more strength. And his followers could have provided that strength, and hopefully between sleeping sessions there they did. And then he went a little further, and he fell to his face, and he communed with his father, and he prayed. 
This tells me in the heat of the moment, don't get alone. And we could take that one a thousand directions right now. We're not going to. But in the heat of our moment, don't be alone. Have spiritual encouragement and accountability. You know, with smart devices today, it ain't hard to just pray. Just have that list of people on your phone, and when it's, when it's showtime and you know it, please pray right now. Send. That's not hard to do. Jesus took three of his closest ones and said, I need you right now to pray for me. And then he went even further, and he prayed with his heavenly Father. He communed with him. So even when we're all alone, void of humans, we have our Heavenly Father. We're not really all alone. You've got to know yourself. And you've got to know when you're weak. And you've got to know when you're in a bad spot. Number three, another critical no-no, is know the Word of God. Why? Well, in the armor of God that Paul described, it's the only one that's an offensive weapon. That sword that can penetrate. And we have to trust it. We have to trust that the Word of God is doing more than we can physically see. The Word is doing more than we can sometimes notice and recognize. And that's the trust part. It's a spiritual weapon. And it's speaking to spiritual entities. And a lot of times it is manifested for us to see a change in an atmosphere, a change in a person's demeanor, a quietness in our mind and in our heart. It affects our physical symptoms. But we need to know it's doing even more in an unseen realm that we don't even recognize a lot of times. That's where the trust part comes in with the Word of God. It's a spiritual weapon. But we got to know it to use it, right? Just walking around like holding a Bible, I don't know that that's really, you know, doing anything to the realm of darkness. Maybe it is, I don't know. You know, like vampires, you hold up garlic and all those crazy sci-fi movies, right? No, we're supposed to know the word. We're supposed to speak the word. We're supposed to speak it into the atmosphere. We got to know it in our heart. Yesterday we were digging a ditch, Brandon and Brady and I. About a 100, 100 foot ditch just for a downspout. And we did it the old fashioned way with shovels and picks. So we had one pick and they were taking turns, you know, swinging about 10 times and then give it to your brother and Brandon goes, you know, we've got to get another one around here. This is taking too long. So he goes up and gets another one. So they're standing around like leaning on both picks. I'm like, well, this, this made a lot of difference, right? This is really speeding up progress. And it made me think, you know, you got you got to swing it if it's going to do anything for you. Just having a pick isn't getting the ditch dug any sooner, right? you got to swing that thing. you got to get down in the trenches and go to work. And so my point is, where, where it kicked in with my brain is just having that thing, you got to read it. You got to know it. You got to wield it out and start using it against the enemy. If, if it's in your heart, it's in your mind, you can use it in those heat of the moment moments. In the temptation of Jesus in the desert, we all know this, and I didn't, I didn't have it all out for us to read verse by verse. But three different times against his satanic assault, what did he say? It is written. It is written. And that's for a purpose, because then he quoted scripture that had the power to, to work against that satanic assault. And then the second thing he did, Jesus, when he got done quoting scripture, he just simply rebuked him. He just simply spoke to that force of darkness and said, away from me, Satan. He spoke audibly. He spoke out loud. And he directed the source of power within him that is greater than the source that was coming against him. And I want to tell you, you have that source. You have that power. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So use that force. Use that power. Speak that name. And speak it to whatever you're feeling is oppressing you. Speak it to Satan. Get away from me, devil. Get away from me, Satan. I rebuke you. You leave this house. You leave my child. You leave me alone. Speak it. Rebuke him and say it is written and use his word as the sword that it is. That's critical in the heat of the moment, moment. Next thing we got to know, no, no, number four, know the situation. Because each moment of our life has a different situation. And this has a football tie-in for me because I'm always preaching, I was even preaching this week about what's the down and distance? What do we need on this play right now? Because every down, every play is a different situation. And it's going to cause you to use maybe a different technique, maybe to line up different. It's going to cause uh, the offense to call a certain play. So you got to know what's the situation going on at that time. What is at stake here? Be aware of the surroundings. 
Be aware of, of, of who's watching. Be aware of who's going to be impacted. Be aware of how's it going to affect your family. Genesis 39, this temptation that Joseph was in. It was amazing, the strength that he had. I'm going to read this and, and, it, and just point out a couple of things. In Genesis 39, from the time that he was put in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in his house and in his field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well-built and handsome, and after a while his master's wife took notice of him, and Joseph said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. He said, With me in charge, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. One day, he went into the house to attend his duties, and none of the servants was inside. Uh-oh. He's what? Alone. He was alone. She caught him by the cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left, and this is where my thing cut off. <laughs> he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. Amazing self-control, right, that Joseph demonstrated there. He acknowledged his position. He acknowledged his responsibility. He acknowledged the trust that Potiphar, his master, had over him. And that's so important to know the situation that you're in, the place that God has put you, the trust that he has in you the platform he's given you, the children he's given you, the audience, the uttermost, wherever he has you, he has entrusted that to you. That should be resonant in your mind when you're thinking about doing something. He's entrusted this spouse. He's entrusted these children. He's entrusted these coworkers, these neighbors. He planted us here. And i got to be a good steward of this. And this matters how I act right now. Because I'm reflecting who I say I am. And Joseph acknowledged that. I've said this before, but I, I still look back and I'm amazed at Coach Tressel's wisdom when he would tell his team right after a game on Saturday, when we, he knew the rest of the weekend was meant to kick back and do, you know, all kinds of things. He'd say these three things. Remember who you are. Call your parents and worship somewhere tomorrow. Each one of those things that he said helped us understand the situation at hand. That we wore a letter on our jacket or the uniform, and we represented something bigger than just ourselves. That's part of the situation. When you're out in public, that's who you're representing. So do you have a Jesus bumper sticker on your car? Do you wear anything Jesus on person? Have you proclaimed Christ as Lord? Understand who you are with how you act and what you say. And he said, call your parents. He wanted us to be reminded that we have folks at home, not only to build us up and to encourage us, but we represent them as well. We're carrying a legacy beyond ourselves. And he said, worship somewhere. Then he wanted us connected to the ultimate source of power for getting this done, and that was God. There was so much wisdom in those three reminders that he'd give us. But anyway, keys for Joseph here, just quickly in this, practical things. He realized that sinning wouldn't just be against Potiphar, Potiphar's wife. It'd be sinning against who? He said God. Sinning against God. That's the magnitude that kept Joseph for day after day after day refusing that. He was a man, right? I'm sure there was part of him tempted, but he kept acknowledging his responsibility, the trust he'd been given, and who he was ultimately sinning against, and that was God. And the second thing I think is a no-brainer here, ultimately what he had to do to get out of there was what? Run. It's just too strong. I gotta run. I gotta get out of this present room. Leave. We can't miss that. And the Bible tells us to flee from the desires of your youth to flee sexual immorality. There's different times when the Bible tells us, hey, leave, it's okay. I know you got your armor. 
And I know you're called to stand, but sometimes standing is, stand over there. Don't stand here. Right? Still standing. Anyway, last thing about know the situation. We've got to be reminded, too, that situations are momentary. Moments are momentary. And this is we've got, we got to hold on to when moments are tough, when moments are hard, when moments are just, i got nothing left. Grandma Brungard here. Ready? This too shall pass. Now, that's not Scripture. She didn't make that up. She got it from the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, when he said, our light and momentary troubles. They're doing something, and, but they're just momentary. Hold on to that. You're going to make it. This isn't going to last forever. It might last the rest of your earthly existence, but eternity is far longer than that. And you're going to get to lay this down when I welcome you into my kingdom. Finally, last one, know the plan. The fifth no-no we have to have in the heat of the moment is to know the plan. To remain free, we've got to be reminded of what I'm here to do. What's my purpose? I just go back to Joseph. He knew his purpose. He knew the plan. He, he just, the situation and what he'd been given, he knew that. Where are the places that I should and shouldn't be? Got to have a plan. What are my ways of escape if it gets a little too hard? What, what, how am I getting out of there? Got to have a plan. If you don't have a plan or a purpose, you wind up in places that you never really wanted or intended to be. Right? Aimless. We get in trouble with that type of night, right? Just taking a road trip. Careful with that. Here's a temptation that went the wrong way. A man after God's own heart. 2 Samuel 11, 1 to 5. King David. It says, in the springtime at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around the roof of the palace, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. And then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. Now obviously, some practical things here. David was warned. And, and when we are in the, in the midst of temptation, we've got to heed the warning that God gives us. The conviction, knowing this doesn't feel right, that's there for a reason. That's why this attendant said, isn't this a daughter of someone? Isn't this a wife of someone? In other words, David, she's not yours. I know you're king, and I, I know you think you're hot stuff, but she doesn't belong to you. That was really God saying that to him, but he didn't heed that warning. His flesh was just on fire at that moment, and he, and he couldn't refuse. But the first part of it is he was at the wrong place, and he shouldn't have been there. At the time of the year when kings normally go off to war, David remained in Jerusalem. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time. and We don't know why. I don't know. But not having a purpose and not having a plan just means you're out walking around looking for stuff. And David just couldn't sleep, just out walking around. Saw a beautiful woman. How did he know she was beautiful? Guess he must have looked longer than once. Right? Guess his eyes just didn't bounce. He didn't look and say, whoa, right there, let's look this way. Didn't do that, did he? No, he, he locked in. There's some real practical insights here, men and women about how we handle this type of temptation. Don't have time for all that. But just know the plan. What's your plan for your life? What's your purpose? What are you called to do? Where are you supposed to be? How am I getting out if it goes wrong? Know that. I'm going to close with this. Psalm 46.1. The psalmist knew 3,000 years ago, this thing right here, that God is our refuge and God is our strength. And he is an ever-present help in trouble. We have an ever-present, right now, momentary help for this moment. Well, what about tomorrow? Well, you know what? Tomorrow, when you're in that moment, he's an ever-present help tomorrow, too. But right now, brothers and sisters, we have an ever-present source of power that wants you to be free, that can help you to be free. So I want you to think about right now. We've talked for three weeks about freedom, about freedom from our past, about freedom from fear, about tomorrow, about worry. 
in, in how to be free in the moment right now. What is it in your life that you struggle most with in the area of freedom? What is it that most keeps you in bondage? Is it something from your past? Are you a worrier about the future and trusting God? Have you never met a temptation that you can't refuse? What part of it do you most struggle with? And I believe what, what we need to do right now is to take a minute and just acknowledge. Just acknowledge God. Acknowledge the freedom that he has for us and the area of our life that we are not ex coming close to experiencing. We need to acknowledge that right now. As I said at the beginning, in the heat of the moment, you've got to first know God. Do you know God? We, we assume the majority of you do, but maybe one or two of you don't. And without that knowledge, that intimacy of God, His Spirit in you, quite honestly, you're powerless. You're powerless against some of the temptations that we encounter day to day. But you can know God today. You can know Him intimately. You can receive the gift of His Holy Spirit and be introduced to a source of power that will keep you free from things that normally had you so shackled, so much under its control. It's amazing. Come on, brothers and sisters. Am I telling the truth? Greater is he that is in you. Well, maybe he's not in you. Maybe, honestly, number one, I don't know God. I don't know him that way. I know of him, but I don't really know him. Maybe today's a day that you need to know him. And I'm just going to take a few moments, and uh, maybe we can play a, a worship song, guys. And I would invite you to get some assistance, to don't go at this alone, to bring a spouse, bring a friend, grab an elder, grab a pastor, I don't care, and to ask for prayer, and to acknowledge, quite honestly, where I am at with this. And I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired and giving the control of my life and giving my freedom away every time I encounter this. Every time the thought comes into my head, there I go again. And if you're weary of this battle, come receive prayer because we want you to build up and encourage you to go out and kick its butt one more day. And tomorrow you'll wake up and do that again. So let's take it one day at a time and let's take this moment, the only moment we have right now, the only moment God assures us this present moment. And if you're feeling conviction, heart beating, come receive some prayer. Let's take a moment. God, I thank you for the, this moment. I thank you for, for being a provider of, of moments in our life where we we realize uh, we're powerless against this. We, we've been accepting life uh, not as you have designed it or planned it. Forgive us, God, for, for not living life free. Forgive us, God, for allowing the cares of tomorrow and the regrets of the past to ruin the present, to ruin the gift of today. And so often we settle. And so often we just were satisfied with a portion of what you want us to experience and, and enjoy. So God, I pray that throughout this time in your word, it, you reveal to us, Lord, what true freedom is, what it looks like. You've, you've pointed into places in our heart that, that you want to, to have surrendered, areas that we are trying to control t way too much. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And I thank you for that gift, that gift that we can enjoy right now today. For you are a God who gives us our daily bread. And we thank you for the gift of right now and what you did here today. And I pray that you received our worship, our prayers, our hearts, and you're satisfied with where your children are right now as we leave this room and we go out into our, our own little world that we go from a place of victory and we are ready for what you have for us. I just bless this congregation, my brothers and sisters, for their obedience, for their life, their lifestyle, the joy, the courage, the way they live their life and the way it teaches me and humbles me and encourages me. Bless them, God. All that they take to this week, Lord. Bless them. It's in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Have a great week, brothers and sisters.